Rick Heinrichs, production designer on Glass Onion. Um, I know you studied an actual onion in prep for this film. So what did you learn about onions? <laughs> that uh, you cry when you cut into them. Um, <laughs> but uh, it was a it was an effort on my part in doing research. It's a little bit of an apocryphal story, but <laughs> um, I, I was studying all kinds of different uh, sort of architectural domes that could be considered like onion-y, like onion domes and that sort of thing. And I, I was really uh, realizing that everything just looks like what you think uh, when you think of an onion dome, you kind of know what that looks like and all of that. And I really wanted to kind of, you know, get around that and sort of uh, design it from the ground up. And so I took an onion out of the fridge, literally, and um, started to, to uh, cut the layers and realized how, you know, structural it all was and how thick the layers were. And in the scale of the dome that we ended up using for glass onion, uh, it it felt um, I, I could see just literally by cutting it how I wanted to deal with the front face, the side that you first see the onion dome at. And I don't know, it was very inspirational. Um, and I feel like um, no one's made that exact glass onion dome before. So I felt very good about that. Mm -hmm. So what went into that design for the the first side of it that we see on the island? Uh, it it uh, um, I designed a balcony off of the office that Miles could go out and survey his island and all of his domain, and the uh, the way that I cut into it uh, informed how my um, a concept artist and the art director that I worked with uh, Andrew Bennett how to um, sort of. Um, uh, uh, you know, you know, create layers uh, out of glass um, that felt architectural, that felt they, like they reinforced the kind of central aspect of, of what's inside this glass onion that we were trying to hint at. So mm -hmm. it felt, uh, felt kind of like um, uh, that it was reinforcing the metaphoric use of the glass onion for our, for our, our film. Yeah, everything is hidden in plain sight. <laughs> yes, exactly. Exactly. Um, I know you guys uh picked or uh, filmed like the exteriors lease at a real villa in Greece, and then that's the one you chose, obviously, to uh build or design the, the dome on top of. So how did you have to go about um, I guess, keeping in mind the the architectural integrity of the real building? Um, mm. and how it could hold uh, an orb on top of it? That's a great question. And uh, you're obviously a bit of a student of architecture yourself. I had to ask myself that. And um, and that was always uh, my great fear about, you know, kind of uh, introducing a um, element that w worked against the architecture. And we we did look at other places but because of the fact that this this place, which is a, uh, it's actually a place called Villa Twenty, which is part of the Amanzo uh, Hotel in on the Peloponnese. So it's not on an island; it's actually inland on on the Peloponnese Peninsula. Um, but the the um, uh, the architecture and the architect of the place, Edward Tuttle, who does who did all of the Amans uh, around the world. Um, this the owner of this particular villa worked with him on, uh, and he and he was resisting the idea of putting a stairway up it. But there was this great hierarchical feeling to the place, almost like you were climbing to the top of the Acropolis or something like that. And uh, and it was a very sort of modernist take on Greek architecture and classical architecture. It just felt like some you know somebody who 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 felt above it all and um, almost a little bit of a god himself would plant themselves on top of this. And so the pavilion on top, weirdly, uh, it it um, it would be presumptuous of me to say that it needed a glass onion uh, on top of it, but 
it really didn't hurt it that much to sort of place it there. It actually felt weirdly uh, organic to the intent of the place. But uh, just in case, I added a few other glass sort of skylights to to help sort of, um, you know, reinforce that shape and be a, a variation on that theme. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah. when you're looking at it, it's not just like this one hunk of... Well, you also dome. need the platform for baby blue, the car. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, it, it's that's exactly right. And, and it's one of those magical things about um working in films and designing films that things evolve so much and and um it is such a great process of give and take and with a, a uh a director like ryan to work with on it um it it's uh, just a joy to to do that, that sort of thing so for instance the baby blue on top of the atrium well that just evolved um and it's just however the way his mind was working we did have that scene in the office um was actually taking place in a completely different location um on the island uh in a garage but it um it 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 felt wrong to go from you know the wide open seas down into a dark garage and it, it felt um it just felt wrong period and mm -hmm. and ryan is very much uh he's he's an extremely bright guy and he really does understand uh what the feeling is what the what the projection of what's going on and how it should feel in the film and he just came up with this idea of uh what if the car is just you know the car wasn't the center of the conversation but it was certainly an important object to sort of ground help ground that scene so being able to introduce the office at that point and be able to have the car be part of that, that's very counterintuitive. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have to hand it to Ryan for coming up with the uh, um, the odd choice that is so um, funny and, and appropriate that co goes all the way through the film and pays off at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Well, I know you guys built the interior of the Glass Onion on a soundstage in Belgrade, right? So what That's was it like right. designing the interior, basically, because it is a lot of uh, clear furniture, like the desk, and then you have to deal with reflections. Um, but it also um, mm -hmm. reflects, no pun intended, his uh, vapid personality, I guess you could say. Yes. So. <laughs> Yes, it's it's a it's quite a task to uh, to be to be set the job of um, creating the most vapid um, you know set imaginable, and I and I grabbed hold of that and uh, took it as far as I could. Um, the uh, yeah, we wanted the furniture to it it just needed to feel organic to uh, what the whole concept of a glass onion is, and of course. That is probably as far as I, I imagined um, um, uh, Miles's imagination would go. Certainly not his bank account. Um, so he could have afforded a lot more, I'm sure, if he had wanted to. But there is something oddly sort of withheld. Uh, when you're down in the atrium, it's it's the opposite sort of. It's, it's an explosion of... Uh, of color and, and art and um, extravagant living um the uh, office of the glass onion itself feels a little bit more a little bit more like a temple in a, in a way uh, uh, partly the way it's set up to begin with and just partly the simplicity and and um almost holiness of the place um feels uh, very much like something uh that miles with this sort of faux mysticism would uh, build for himself mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. I love the atrium as well, because like you said, it's uh, the complete opposite in terms of design and, and color, but it also still ref reflects his personality because it's so garish. And it's like, yeah. this is something like how someone with so much money uh, would spend to show off that they have good taste. But then mm -hmm. um, when you look at the room, yeah. it's like, you don't actually have good taste. <laughs> Exactly. I mean, the the idea and, and it's it's walking a line because um, you know, obviously he's got his incredibly beautiful paintings by famous artists. And um, 
there it's very rich when you're shooting actors against that artwork and and the um the individual frames are utterly gorgeous but it 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 is uh, obviously no one would hang art cheek by jowl like that uh and in in that that kind of eclectic mix of uh you know, glass craft art and um, um, uh, Basquiat paintings and um, uh, rich uh, ancient uh, uh, architectural ruins and and sculpture and all of that. Um, but uh, Miles certainly. Um, this is uh, this is also a little bit um, uh, emblematic of his what's going on in his in his head. Sure, it's empty, but at the same time. It's just full of the neurons are firing all in all directions at the same time. So um, was was really um, trying to play a bit with the um, that that duality of of the 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 emptiness and the um, extravagant uh, over energy and abundance. Mm -hmm. I uh, literally laughed out loud in the theater uh, at the the painting of Ever Norton. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. so how did uh, that come about of course he had to paint himself uh, that's uh that's our um you know we have art inspired by artists and in, in addition to art by famous artists that we licensed and did our own paintings of uh the, the mona lisa uh mm -hmm. not least among them um and uh the um this was like you know edward norton uh, from the time of Fight Club, sort of uh, in um, full kind of Lucian Freud um, uh, 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 abandonment and and serious uh, art mode, basically. And he's uh, um, he, he's the, what I love about the way it is, and it sort of faces the Mona Lisa in in the atrium. It's just they're 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 sort of two bookends for the whole center area where all the glass art is um the, and um and and he's obviously regarding the mona lisa across the way in in this way uh and associating himself with it uh and um and really taking himself a little both not too seriously and yet too seriously at the same time mm -hmm. um well in the uh, movie's theme of disruption i was wondering how uh or is it difficult at all as a production designer also working with like set deck um like you know the movie itself like there's a lot of things hidden in plain sight like it it tells you kind of what to look for if you rewatch you can notice all the clues and everything so how do you keep that in mind when you're designing a room like that and also like the glass onion where there's so much going on um and you want like the the clue or the piece of information to be in the scene um somewhere uh but you don't want to call too much attention to it that'll give it away mm -hmm. so you're just kind of distracting the viewer especially in the atrium with all this other stuff going on in the room right yeah um i think i think i understand i um well in terms of work process uh it's terrifying to uh start any set uh and exciting at the same time um, and particularly one which has is layered the way this is um, with both, um, you know, real intent and hidden meaning at the same time. And it's and as a production designer, you uh, are building, you're d designing for um, uh, for the director and the cinematographer to discover those things in a way as well. Uh, and 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 almost to a certain degree, having their own take on it. So you you've got to lay things out there. And we 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 certainly talked about it a lot ahead of time. And Ryan was part of the development of everything. Um, at the same time, once you come to actually shoot it, it's a whole new ball game. And um, you know there were there were many different sort of priorities or jobs and um, kind of hats I was putting on there. And one of them was. Um, always making something interesting uh, to go uh, in the film, in the uh, behind the frame that's, that's telling a character story or part of the visual narrative in one respect or another. Um, but also 
um, how does it tie together and, um, you know, kind of comment upon the, the big arc of the film at the same time. Uh, so there's there's detail and then there's the big picture. And uh, the um, uh, and then so you you do have these little hints and clues and and elements that you're peppering around. And you're kind of leaving it up to uh, the director and the cinematographer to find those things in their own time. And that's that's part of the fun of it. And um, and you just hope they um, are able, you know, we were in the atrium for probably, uh, you know, I think a good 30 minutes of the film anyway, a very large chunk of the film is, takes place in there. Maybe it's less, I'm not sure, but it's it was a, a significant chunk. And, and so um, uh, having the audience feel like there's a lot to take in there and to study, and is that a clue? And does this uh, mean something? Is this a foreshadowing or is it just a red herring? All of that is at play. And um, so it, I guess what I'm trying to say is it's it's a, it's it's a big undertaking on something like this. Most sets don't tell that kind of story, yeah. uh, not to the degree that 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 did in, in, in such an important way uh, for the feel of the film. But um, uh, it, it, it was a case of like, uh, how do we start this? And with any set, you just have, you start it one way or another and you get into it and it does, it becomes its own journey. Uh, one that I was including Ryan in and and um, having his comments on and his additions. And, you know, we were, we were riffing on the Beatles and there are a number of things in the glass art that you, um, if you, if you, if you, you know, probably if you freeze if you the pause. frame, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> probably uh, you'll see. Um, and there are, and, but they're glass too. So they're, some of them are not that easy to see, uh, but, but you can kind of see, the, I mean, I'll give you a few things because why not? Uh, there's, um, you know, we do have, uh, the cast iron shore, um, which is a line from Glass Onion. There's, uh, but I've, I put a Lady Madonna on it. There is a bust of Lenin wearing Lenin glasses, except oh, it's, okay. it's Vladimir Lenin, not John Lenin. <laughs> um, and uh, there's, uh, I mean, there's just, it's just a playful. Um, yeah, it's like fun Easter eggs. And, and, and fun Easter eggs. Uh, and um, and things to entertain, you know the the little the little boy that they push down the head of uh, that 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 re re resets the Mona Lisa security is the fool on the hill, mm -hmm. and so you know we've got um, oh there's a bunch of different things. Um, it's not just uh, Beatles; it's other elements of uh, of um, you know we uh, Ryan came in and he saw the Mark Rothko painting above the fireplace and and uh the and the painting is called red over dark blue and so it's not hard for Miles to have known this but he, uh, Ryan told me to turn it upside down because that's something Miles would do he, he so. would do that yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly um well when I when I told people I was going to talk to you they were very excited because they love the set everyone uh thought it was such uh amazing production design and one of my friends was like please ask about the glass onion neon sign from the bar because she's obsessed with it <laughs> sure i know it's i'd i wish i had that <laughs> um so uh we well look um that was always uh, the key thing in ryan's script is that the the genesis of the disruptors and their their circle of friends and in fact ryan's uh, no, I'm, excuse me miles's backstory uh, and, and, you know, realizing he's kind of this nerdy guy who just weirdly kind of, uh, found, fell into the, the, the right, um, situation and took advantage of it and exploited it. Um, the, the, uh, the fact that this, there's this memory that he has that kind of gives him a little bit of an emotional pause when he considers it is, uh, in a way, that's the heart of the glass onion, and um, and is that real? You know, I mean, probably to some degree, in in so far as this character allows it to be a real emotion, that is a real 
thing. I, I was really, um, I, I didn't have anything to do with this part. I was fascinated that Ryan and, and um, Steve, the cinematographer, uh, when he was looking at the glass sung in uh, the photograph of the disruptors and he was mm -hmm. leaning into it, they put his, his face into a dark shadow there. Mm -hmm. And um, I just, I, I love that note. I was trying to, oh my God, what, you know, is this, um, uh, and, and uh, Daniel Craig was in, still in full light for that moment. And so, so they flagged it and, and it's kind of interesting that the, the decision was made to um, not let the scene get maudlin or anything like that, but, but in, in weirdly sinister at the same time. Yeah. It's kind of nostalgic and it's kind of like what happened. Cause especially later when you find out that he was the newbie in the group and then just completely turned the world upside down so yeah exactly yeah exactly and and um you know I, ryan's very clever the the other uh thing that I've, I've mentioned before but i i can't say it enough is um how much of a overture the um the the, the invitation box is to the film itself um and you don't really realize it until maybe you see it the second time or something like that it's like Oh my God, that's they, they he actually is telling us what is going to happen in the film. And um uh, you know, they're gonna solve some puzzles and and then everything's going to reset itself and, and respin. Yep. Um and um, you know, that's that's some um, and it's also a line in the movie. It's like someone reset it and send it to you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, they tell us what's gonna happen. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um so well, there's, Rick there's a lot going on there. Yeah, uh, it was great speaking with you. Thanks so much for your time and course, congratulations yeah, on the film. It's uh, incredible stuff there. So thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks, Joyce. Yeah.